So uh, I often get asked about uh, stretching a VMware cluster. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to do was to cover that uh, and on my whiteboard with some fancy stickers and some fancy magnets and whiteboard pens. Some of my favorite tools. So um, now stretching a VMware cluster is absolutely, um, absolutely achievable uh, and can be a really cool thing to do. However, you've got to understand the limitations. You've got to understand why the limitations are there. So, which we often uh, spend a couple of hours whiteboarding up, but I'm going to summarize it now. Clearly, I've got no people questioning me, so I can whiz through it. Uh, we've got a NetApp cluster here. It doesn't have to be NetApp. Most vendors put implement um, in a very similar way. So, we've got two storage controllers, synchronous and rear between them, and these are clustered together. Uh, whether it clustered, uh, however, that clustering works here. We've got some storage presented, presented up through ESX hosts and up to some VMs. Uh, clearly, in an, in an infrastructure that warrants metro cluster, more hosts, more VMs. But it's simple. So, <coughs> your storage systems are uh, some of these are going to be synchronously replicating, uh, sorry, these are all going to be synchronously replicating, some of them replicating to um, one direction, others replicating another direction. Uh, active, active data centers. So, each of the <coughs> Each of the local systems are going to be talking, uh, data stores presented up, talking down through the ESX hosts, down to their local storage. Uh, likewise down the other side, much the same thing, down to your storage system, down to the local disks. All works great, uh, there's our stretch VMware cluster, very very simply. The problem happens with, within a, a standard VMware cluster, uh, we've created uh, an HA and DRS cluster, so now these VMs can start the motioning between the two different sites. There's no, no rules in place yet to say, to say what they can and can't do. The storage is available by both sites. Um, <clears throat> now the problem now gets is that for this system to access its storage, it has to go uh, down through the fabric to this storage system, which is then synchronously replicated back across the fabric, to its partner system, and then confirmation comes back up. This system, again, back through the fabric, down to its local disks, which is synchronously replicated across, confirmation comes all the back up the WAN. In addition to that, we've got any network communication that was previously local between uh, a local site, is now traversing the, uh, the uh, extended network, um, which is going to increase the latency. Now, because this is a stretch layer 2 VLAN, uh, there's no um, geographic locations assigned to IP addresses, so they don't know that these are now in a, a geographically different site. <coughs> so even if you've got massive links on these with the stretch networking and the stretch fabric, you're still going to have a, an additional amount of latency applied to these systems. <coughs> so this can lead you into, into a situation where these VMs uh, are getting increased latency for no particular reason. They have no knowledge of why they've got increased latency. The only way you're going to know is to go and look at these hosts and see, oh, they're in data center B rather than data center A. <coughs> so, move these all back and let's start talking about how we get around these issues. Uh, so, one of the things you want to be looking at doing is actually creating uh, affinity groups. So you're going to assign these um, within this local data store, you're going to assign these affinity groups to these hosts here, and these systems over here, you're going to create affinity groups to these hosts here. So if one of these hosts dies, these systems aren't going to uh, HA over here, instead they're going to stay here and HA onto, this, onto the passive node here, or the, the remaining active nodes here. Likewise, one of these systems dies, these aren't going to HA, they'll just stay in local systems. So that prevents, that prevents some of the... Um, uh, th those same rules will stop vMotion from going across the two sites as well. <coughs> so that's going to help you here. It's going to protect you against local site failure and it's going to stop these machines moving over here when you don't need them to. You've now still got the advantage of saying, right, I've got site maintenance uh, on site A, I need to completely shut the system down, so I'm going to vMotion all these systems to my other site. Now at this point, they're still accessing storage across the WAN. So now I also need to fail over my storage. So I'm going to shut my storage system down, take it offline. Uh, all the storage is then going to be made available over here. So now everything's local over here. These ESX hosts just stay offline. We don't dynamically move physical hosts. We also don't dynamically move this physical host. So 
So now we've shut that side down. Uh, it can go for maintenance and that's fine. When it comes back up, we then bring the ESX host back up, we fail the cluster back over, storage is now available back over here, and then we motion things back over. Now that's great for, for planned maintenance um, and it, it definitely helps out. The biggest challenge with that is that takes a long time. Um, vMotion is going to take the amount of time that's, uh, to, to move the active memory. Each of these systems is 4 gig system, you've got 200 of them, you're going to have to move 800 gig across the site uh, before that site's completely evacuated. The cluster, you have to make sure you can do that without an outage. <coughs> so predicted failures, this works really well. The problem is with unplanned failures. So uh, we've already seen I can lose an individual host, that's fine. I can lose uh, an individual storage controller, and again, that should be fine, because these are clustered together. They'll detect that a single component over here has died. What they won't protect you from is this entire site dying. So we've lost the fabric links, we've lost the network links to this site. This site is technically dead. This site won't pick it up. Most storage controllers, with maybe an exception of, uh, of um, something like VPlex, which you can set uh, 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 you, s you set waiting on one of the sites to, to come up in that in that split brain scenario. Most controllers will do nothing. So there's a manual intervention for you to come in here and tell the controller to fail back. VMware isn't necessarily going to understand that. So VMware is going to sit here waiting for the storage to be online because at this. At the point before you brought the system back online, you told the cluster to fail over. This system is still owning these LUNs. So you need to start, tell the controller here to fail over, to aggressively fail over the storage. Then it's presented up to these ESX hosts. At that point, HA can kick in. When HA tries for the first time, it'll fail to get um, uh, access to those LUNs and it'll start retrying. It will continue retrying until um, those LUNs are available again. So you can just kind of sit there. And then eventually, these VMs will come back up. <coughs> but that is absolutely manual intervention. What you can do is you can either have uh, a witness box, uh, either in a preferred site, so site A, site B, you say site B is the preferred site, witness server's here, and it's monitoring site A. If that goes down, it forcefully shuts down site A, if it can, or just forcefully raises things here. Ideally, this witness site is actually in site C, somewhere else. Um, preferably that's got relatively neutral network access to both sites, so if anything happens to either site, it knows that chances are it's a site failure, not its network failure. <coughs> um, you've still got the problem of, of um, a split brain. So someone digs up the road outside here, uh, all your users are in site A. So your, all your links go down, site B is still up and running, site B detects that site A has gone down, brings up everything here, but your users are still accessing here. That's pretty much a disaster. That's your worst case disaster. Not only if you had a catastrophic failure in your WAN links uh, or your data center links, but you've also now got active, active data being served here in site B, which may be for remote users and local users accessing site A. <clears throat> so this sort of sort of scenario is catastrophic in many different ways. So actually the idea of having a stretch cluster <clears throat> that can automatically detect any kind of um, failure event, recover from it automatically, is something that is incredibly scary. And you probably want to try and avoid as much as possible. So stretch clustering is great for proactive failures, so when you know that something's going to go wrong, you know a hurricane's coming at your data centre, you know there's going to be a flood, you know there's going to be a power outage, you know you're going to have to have maintenance on the data centre. It's great for that because you can dynamically move things across, zero downtime. If it's to protect against disaster, Al-Qaeda attacking or um, someone going and maliciously unplugging all your power, it's not going to protect you for that. Not effectively without adding too much risk in other areas. <clears throat> so you need to understand what uh, a stretch cluster is. And a stretch cluster is all about business continuity. And that's about single components failing, maybe large components failing. It's not for a disaster. 